yes, yes we can okay. see it very clear thank you very much nice uh, nice beautiful colored slides is back again thank you uh thank you dr laiman and dr omar for inviting me again to this very nice and exciting meeting uh, i'm going to take about today about some challenges we usually we see them when we do our tbr cases and give some tips and tricks how we can deal with that the most challenge is really when we deal with the TVR, we see it in the sizing, proximal landing zone, distal landing zone, access vessel, spinal cord schema, and indole. And I'm going to go through each one and get some tips and tricks how we can deal with that. Uh, let's start first with the sizing. When we're dealing with aortic arch or thoracic aneurysm, it's very important because the angulation to know the axial diameter measurement is not recommended. We don't use it. There is a reason why you have to have a software with a central line measurement uh, to get the right uh, sizing of the, your landing zone. If you have an tortuous anatomy, usually we use a maximum diameter. If you have a straight anatomy, we use we go with the average diameters. The second most important that when you use the links of the required area you're going to cover, never use a central line because central line will underestimate the links because when you put the T-bar inside the thoracic aorta, is going to take the outer curve. So you need to move your line, uh, your line, central line to the outer curve and get the right uh, length of the device you're going to use. The main challenge when you have a type B dissection, <coughs> then what do you do? Usually when you have a type B dissection, we measure the diameter of the healthy aorta immediately before the dissections. What about the distal landing zone? Because the distal landing zone is collapsed, then you usually use an estimate, but most of the time we use a tapered graft. Third thing, what about the links? How links to how much we need to cover? And this is a very big controversial you know, uh, subject. I can't go over it now. But in general, our practice, we, li- we try to cover at least uh, proximal tear. We use at least minimum 200 uh, millimeter links of the device. I will try to cover the, the all aneurysm part of the dissections. Of course, if you use an IBIS, it would be very helpful in dissection because it gives you more accurate sizing and the and it also helps you to guide you to be inside the tulum and not in the false lumen. And again, the most important, we don't oversize type B dissection. We don't go more than 10% oversize. What about the aneurysm? When you do the aneurysm, we go with more 15 to 20. And even now we go with a 20. We like really to oversize with the aneurysms. If you have a transaction or trauma, we don't go more than 0 to 10%. Of course, if you're going to use a chimney or snorting technique, then we need to go at least 30%. What the problem, if you oversize, then you end with a graft collapse. This is an early, early case from, I think, 2009, when patient has a traumatic thoracic aortic transaction, and he came and they put TVAR, and then they put another one inside it for some reason, and he end with complete infold of the TVAR. And he's a young guy, 20 years old, and he end with a, uh, systemic hypertension. He has to be on three antihypertensive medications. Uh, after many years, we decided to take him and just do balloon angioplasty. We see if we can unfold the, the stent, the T-var. It works really, but it only for a couple of years, and he has to go back on the antihypertensive medications. And then we have no choice. We took him back to surgery. He's a young guy, 29 years old. We don't want him to live with antihypertensive medications. We put him on, we put him on left heart bypass machine, did open thoracotomy, removed that graft, and we, uh, the T-var and put interposition graft. And he did a great after that, and he's off all his antihypertensive medications. What about the second challenge is the landing zone, proximal landing zone. Of course, all of us, we know our landing zone at the arch. We have zone zero, which involving the origin of the innominate artery. Zone one involving the left, uh, the left common carotid artery. Zone two involving the origin of the left subclavian artery. And zone three, distal to left subclavian artery. <clears throat> How we measure? Again, we use a CTA with central line measurement. We go with the outer to outer diameters. Even though some devices with eye view to take it, tell you to go inner to inner, but our practice always we go outer to outer diameters. And the aortic, uh, aorta or the landing zone which we can really land, it should be less than 42 millimeter because the largest device we have is 46. What about the length of the landing zone? The proximal landing zone need at least two centimeter. We cannot compri- compromise that. And this has to be measured from the inner curve, not the central, not the outer curve. Because this is what gives you the seal, the inner curve. 
So you need to have at least two centimeters of the inner curve of the aortic arch. Also, we look at the location of the aortic arch branches. We look at the morphology of the arch. We look at the angulation, calcification, thrombus, and the shape of the uh, aortic arch. But the, the golden rule is the two centimeter. We can compromise with the E-bar, but in the T-bar, you cannot compromise. If you don't get it right from the beginning, you're going to end with more trouble later on if you don't get a good seal. I think the only exception is this uh, paper uh, published in Journal of Vascular Surgery in 2018. The only early exception when you have a blunt thoracic trauma, because in, blunt thoracic, in the blunt thoracic trauma, your nut is different from the aneurysm. Uh, so they found that if you have a shorter landing zone, 10, 20 millimeter, even five millimeter proximal, it's okay and safe if you want to keep the left subclavian artery open because the graft in the traumatic thoracic injury work as a bridge to allow healing. It's not that we're looking for a seal. So even if you get some leak around the T-bar, it's still acceptable as, though, as far as you don't have a free ruptures. But again, they left this to the certain discretion to decide that because sometimes because of the angulation of the arch, you need to cover subclavian. But if you, if you have a short landing zone and you can keep the left subclavian artery open, then it's better to use that. And again, five to 10 millimeters is acceptable in the traumatic thoracic injury. The second thing is that when you land in the aortic arch, it's very important to land when you have a severe angulation to look at the area between the stent. And you need this, this area to be at the curve. Because if you land your stent here, which is this stiff part of the stent at the curve, then you're going to have a bird beak, sorry. Then you're going to end with a bird beak uh, situation and it'll be a problem. So always try to put the curve exactly at this area between the stent. Try to avoid the area with the thrombus and calcifications. If you have difficulty in visualizing the aortic arch because your CR is not good, you don't have a hybrid room, don't hesitate to put a wire in the like in subclavian or common carotid artery to see your, your, your landmark. The most important, you need to use a super stiff wire. You cannot compromise that, like land request or backup wire, especially in the trauma, because if you don't use a very super stiff wires and try to push the device through angulated neck, uh, angulated arch, especially in young people with a trauma, you may end with a rupture and patient die on the table. So you need a lander quest or backup wire. So what do we do if we have to go to zone two, which covering left subclavian artery? Usually we need in about 10 to 50% of the cases. Left subclavian artery is very important for upper extremity perfusions. It's uh, very important for the posterior circulation because it gives the left vertebral artery, which is also important for spinal cord perfusion because we know that the anterior spinal uh, uh, artery Give, uh, branch, uh, give, comes a branch from the vertebral artery. Also, it's very important for the limb for coronary circulation if patient you need in the future bypass surgery. But in general, 90% of the cases you can cover, especially in the trauma, you can cover left subclavian artery without uh, consequences. So if you have to cover subclavian, what options? You can go with a chimney technique, it's very simple. Or you can go with a periscope. Sometimes periscope is better because this way you keep your access for future intervention in the lower extremities. But if you do a chimney, you cannot have access to the lower extremity from the breaker artery. But the problem, you need a longer, uh, longer uh, uh, cover stand than if you do a chimney. The other option, you can do in situ fenestration. But if you do that, you are out of eye view. You are in your own, so you have to be very careful. And hopefully soon we'll have a branched uh, T-var for the left subclavian artery. The other option is to use carotid subclavian bypass or transposition. Some people use it for all patients. Dr. Lapato has he mentioned that for all, if you cover subclavian, or they do bypass. Some people do selectively, and we go with that. If you have a patent lima to LAD, if patient has an abaximity functioning dialysis axis, if he has a dominant left vertebral artery of the left, left vertebral artery coming off the arch. And we strongly recommend it to do a bypass if patient has extensive aortic coverage, you have to cover all the way down to the celiac artery to decrease the chance of paraplegia, or a patient with a risk factor for paraplegia, like he has a prior terminal air repair or internal iliac artery occluded. What the SDS guidelines saying for our covering left subclavian artery? If you done an elective T-var, this is suggested to do revascularizations. 
But if they think that carrying left subcutaneous artery is going to compromise the perfusion to critical, to critical organ, then it's recommended to do a bypass. If you're doing an urgent, uh, urgent TVAR, then don't worry, go and do your TVAR, and then after that you can do bypass or leave it without revascularization. So it depends on the situation of the TVAR you're doing now. What if you have to move to, to zone one? Zone one, which is covering left common carotid artery. At this point, again, you can do two chimney here, but the problem, the more you increase the chimney, this will compromise your ceiling zone. The reason why some people like to do just one chimney and do carotid somebody TVM bypass, or you can do carotid, carotid bypass or transpositions. What happens if by mistake, by inadvert uh, coverage of left common carotid artery during the regular TVAR? You're not planning, but this happened. How you can avoid that by adjusting your C arm to be parallel to the left common carotid artery? If this happens, it's very simple. Just get to the left common carotid artery, put a wire, retrograde, go all the way to the arch, do angioplasty, and mostly you need to put a stent to push the device away from the origin of the left common carotid artery. Sometimes if you don't have this technique or you are not have access to endovascular for some reason, then you always you can do carotid carotid bypass. Really you need to convert it to the opening. What about putting back a device? You can do that, but you have to be very careful because the T-bar has no hook. It has a bar but no hook, but you have to be very careful. You have the gentle flexion. You can, you can pull back for a couple millimeters, but not more than that. But again, I will not advise it unless you have a good endovascular uh, skills and you're not dealing with a trauma because if you're dealing with a trauma, you can rupture the aorta. So you have to be careful with that. What if you have to go to the brachiocephalic artery, then you have to do hybrid repair. You can put a um, big stent in the brachiocephalic artery and then bypasses, or you can go do a total debrushing of the arch. Like this patient, he came to us with a large arch aneurysms and he's not uh, fit for chimneys. So, and he's not fit for open repair, because this kind of patient would like to do an open repair with them, but he was really has a lot of medical problems, not fit for open repair. So we did debrushing from the ascending aorta to the brachiocephalic and left common carotid artery, and they did a T-bar the same setting, and this is our bypass, and this one year follow-up was complete exclusion of the aneurysm and open uh, the branches uh, bypass graft. The other option, you can do a chimney, but again, the more you do a chimney, the more you compromise your seating zone, unless you have a very long uh, uh, proximal seating zone, you need at least three to five centimeters if you have it. Uh, the reason why is better always to decrease the number of the chimney by doing periscope or like bypass and just one chimney. And again, open repel still, I think, the gold standard for arch aneurysm in the fit patients. The other thing is that we always think that T-bar is safe and stroke is very low. And this is really a paper from Bridge Journal of uh, Surgery. They look at the cerebral and silent cerebral infarction and the uh, neurocognition decline during TVAR. And they found that by doing the MRI and transcutaneous uh, TCD, and they found the overall brain injury is about 80%. Clinical stroke 13%, but the silent infarction is about 68%. And this affects the patient neurocognition on the long uh, term. And the most pathology usually reason for the stroke during the procedure could be an air embolism which is trapped between the uh, uh, folded of the graft. The reason why some people now as routinely they flush with the CO2. Could be a thrombus or could be a particle or plaque from the aortic arch. And the same papers they look at by doing the TCD, they look at the hip, which is high intensity transit signals. And they found really the most signals or embolization happened during contrast injection and during stent deployment. But even during the wire and catheter embolize, uh, uh, manipulation, you can get a hit. So you have to be very careful. So how we can prevent that? By avoiding the shaggy aorta, try to minimize uh, catheter and wire manipulations, try to hypnotize patient at least ECT 250 to, to 350, some people, they do temporary occlusion of left common carotid artery. We don't do that. Uh, some people, they starting to use a SIP, which is a supraembolic protection. Again, we don't use it. I see it more people use it with a TAVI. And again, CO2 flushing now become more practical, really, to flush the air from around the graft. And this is the CEP devices, which are available. But again, we don't use it, and we have no experience. 
But I think maybe in the future, with more data coming to show us that the silence infection is only higher than we expected, maybe it will become a routine in the future. Uh, we move now to the distal landing zone. What if we have a problem with the distal landing zone? The distal landing zone, again, we measure outer to outer diameters. We need an oversize, again, 15 to 20 percent. Again, we need at least two centimeters. We look at the curvature and conformity of the aorta. Also, angulation, calcification, and location of the SMA and uh, uh, celiac artery. So if we don't have a distal landing zone, what we use, our first option to go is uh, branched or fenestrated uh, T-bar. The other option to go is a chimney and sandwich, and we have that on the bottle. You can talk about it. And we can do a deep branching or hybrid technique, or we can do an open repair. Uh, this is a uh, This is a branch. We have no time to talk about it, but this is uh, usually our first option. It's available. The only problem it takes long time to get it. An expensive device. Uh, the only thing, if you decide to use a branch of fenestrated, you need to follow up these patients. I'll show you one of our patients that he came with a large flock of the aortic aneurysms involving all the branches. And we get an excellent result. We're able to put four branches. Very nice result. One year follow-up is beautiful. Then he lost for follow-up for some reason. He didn't come until three years. When he came three years, he has a back pain. We do a CT scan. And you can see, fractured his celiac uh, cover the stent. The SMA stent came out completely from its origin. And he came with a huge endolic. So what happened, we went there. We did an angiogram for celiac artery. This fracture was not causing an endolic, but the main endolic coming from the celiac branch came, uh, from the SMA branch came out. We were able to go back to the SMA and put a cover stand, and we sealed the uh, type 3 endolic. And patient did fine for two years, really. After two years, he came back again with a back pain. When they repeat the CD scan, we found our SMA stand is fine, but now the celiac stand came out. The, the extension, the branch came out from the origin. And you can see the celiac stent came out completely with a huge endoleak. Also, he has a leak from the renal stent. We tried doing the vascular, we were not able because the stent was very far from the branch. So what happened at the end, we have to open him up, do the branch for the renal and celiac, and we, stand, we block the uh, origin of the branches, and we stop the endoleak, and the patient did fine after that. So again, my advice is that if you need a branch of instructed, you need to follow up this patient carefully because you get some problem with the branch in the futures. Chimney technique, again, Dr. Lapato was us here. I mean, he can talk about it. It's, I mean, it's a very nice technique. It is, you know, it's no time to go through the details, but it's one of the options if you need to deal with the rock of the aortic aneurysms. Hybrid procedure, it is more tolerable procedure, less invasive than open. The complication is mortality is lower than open repair, and the neuro event is usually is lower. This is patient came us with rock of the aortic aneurysms again. And we planning to debranch him uh, from the iliac to go to the post renal. I want to just maybe because celiac was occluded. Sometimes what we use, we call the sutureless anastomosis. We put a viaband inside our bypass graft to snake our bypass is much easier, especially with the renal artery. So what happened? We had this our bypass to the right renal, and then we go from the side and we put a viaband inside the renal artery. So it become like a hybrid stent. This is the right, and this is the left renal. This is a viaband. This is our bypass graft. And this is bypass to the SMA. And this is our angiogram to the both renal and this completion angiogram with complete exclusion of the aneurysm patent or our D branching. Um, so now we finish with the distal landing zone. I will move to the fourth challenge with the axis vessels. The axis vessel, the iliac artery, because a large device, especially the T values, a very large device was 24, 26. Now we're getting, of course, with the lower profile devices. But the old one is very large devices. Uh, if the artery is very calcified or not, you can use a contralateral iliac artery. You can use multiple dilators. You can do angioplasty or standing if you have a localized. But if you have any doubt, the iliac artery is very narrow, is very bad, just don't hesitate to put a conduit. And if you use a conduit, you need at least 10 millimeter dichron uh, conduit. If you have tortuous iliac artery, you, can, you need a lander quest wire to straighten up your tortuosity. You can put some hand pressure on the abdominal water to reduce the tortuosity, or you can do a body wire technique or through and through wire technique to straight your iliac artery. What are the most complications? Of course, it can happen, especially with a large device. You get from bosses, occlusion, dissection, ruptures. The main problem is the rupture. This is what we call it, uh, of course, iliac on a stick. And this happened 
really with the other devices. The most important, don't panic. The most important to keep your wire. As your wire is still in place, you're okay. Then go from contralateral side and put an occlusion aortic balloon and then put a cover stent if you have a good landing zone proximal and distal. And don't worry about covering internal iliac artery. But for some reason, you don't have a good, you don't have cover stent, you don't have good landing zone, small quick flank incision, and you can fix it with the open repair. Then we move to the spinal cord ischemia. This is the fifth uh, uh, challenge, the cord ischemia during the T-VAR. Some people, they do the, routinely they drain all the, you know, patient with the need a T-VAR. Some people do selectively, especially if we have a long segment descending thoracic coverage, if we have to go all the way down to the uh, celiac, we prefer to do a uh, drainage. If patient has a bilateral air repair, if we cover left subclavian without bypass, all of his internal iliac artery are occluded. Of course, we do therapeutic. If we patient develop any sign of numbness, tingling, or paralysis after surgery, then we go and put the drain. Why we don't do it in every patient? Because also CSF drainage has its own complications. You can get a CSF leak with a headache, or, or you can get a meningitis, you can get intracranial hemorrhage. We have one patient who developed a paraplegia because he developed hematoma around the spine from the spinal drainage, but luckily this recovered later on. So also CSF drainage has its own complications. If you, do use, if you decide to use CSF drainage, you have to follow this protocol. It's very important. The most important to zero the spinal pressure at the level of the spine, because the nurses, they always, when they deal with the central line, always they go with the heart level. So you have to tell them they go to the spine level. You need to keep the spinal pressure less than 10. Don't drain more than 20 cc per hour. Otherwise, you may end with a subarachnoid hematoma or fatal brain stem herniation. If the CSF stem bloody at any time, turn it off. You need to keep the spinal drainage for 48 to 72 hours because sometimes you get a delayed paraplegia. So if you put it, don't remove it next day, at least two or three days. And of course, avoid hypertension. Don't use any vasopressors. You can use alpha agent if your blood pressure is down because you need to keep your blood pressure up. If patient de develop a delay neurological deficit, if patient he did fine surgery after two days, he developed a paraplegia. Then we call what called a COPS protocol. First, we look at the CSF. If we have a CSF, if we don't have a CSF, we go and put it right away. If we have a CSF drainage, we look at its function. If it's functioning fine or not. If it's not functioning, then we have to fix it. If it's functioning fine, we already have a drain, then put the patient flat and you need to drain it to less than five millimeters and try to keep the drain for seven days. Second, look at, look at the oxygenation delivery. You need to oxygen saturation more than 95% and keep the hemoglobin than 12, and also you need to keep the mean blood pressure more than 90, and uh, uh, spinal cord perfusion pressure more than 80. So this is the usual protocol of patient develop and delay in logical uh, deficit, called a COPS, uh, COPS protocol. Endolic, of course, I'm not going to go through that. We have a five type of endolic. We are very familiar with it. I'm not, going, I'm not going to go through it. But the only thing I want to mention that recently we start using a helifix or endo anchors to treat some type 1 endolic. Like this patient, he came with the late type 1 endolic here. From, uh, so when there would couple in, uh, endo anchors, uh, we get good seal. And this is for of CAT scan, very nice. Uh, another patient, he came with a rupture, really, throat of the aortic aneurysms. And the problem is that he has a very short landing zone. SMA is here. We only have 12 millimeters. And he has multiple surgeries before. He has like a large bacteric pseudocyst. He have multiple surgeries. surgery. He has very hostile abdomen. And this is a container ruptures. So what happened, we went there also as a... The breastfall technique depends on the experience, availability, and urgency. But I always feel that if patient is fit, young patient, he has no and he has unfavorable anatomy, I still think open repair is the way to go. Thank you very much.